and gentlemen. Uh... Can I please have your attention? Oh, greetings, gentle remnant listeners. I am sorry to inform you that Jonah Goldberg is absent today, but I, Chris Dyerwalt, uh, his uh, his understudy is here for you. And because Jonah is not here, I am free to exploit uh, cultural and social media trends uh, for fun and profit. So, of course, our guest today is Travis Kelsey. And he's going to talk about his, no, you know, that's not true. That's not true. You have seen, I want to read you a few headlines uh, that occurred in actual news outlets. How often do you think about the Roman Empire, the TikTok trend that exposed the way we think? Uh, What fascinates men about the Roman Empire? We asked experts about the TikTok trend. Do men really think about the Roman Empire? Uh, Experts and students weigh in. And my favorite, perhaps, men can't stop thinking about the Roman Empire. It's because of the masculinity polycrisis. So you know how much people have been talking about how much we're talking about the Roman Empire. And there are a lot of reasons. Uh, We live in what many people believe is the late stages of a republic. Uh, There's a, a ton of comparisons between the United States and Rome always, including the architecture of the buildings that I'm sitting eight blocks away from here in Washington, D.C. But one reason we think and talk so much about the Roman Empire is because of our guest today. Mike Duncan uh, is a autodidactical historian who uh, was one of the trailblazers in the podcasting world, uh, his podcast, The History of Rome from 2007 until 2012, uh, was the uh, what many emulated in the field of a dude who liked a subject, who explored it, and you went along with him as he learned. Uh, he followed that up with his Revolutions podcast, which looked at revolutions here, abroad, uh, and throughout history uh, from 2013 to 2022. He is also the author of the 2021 book, A Hero of Two Worlds, The Marquis de Lafayette in the Age of Revolution, which is a superb, a superb book that helps rescue uh, the memory of one of the most important figures in American history uh, that has been sorely overlooked. But I want, Mike, you to reach farther back into your library to your first book. I think it was your first book, which was called The Storm Before the Storm. Came out in 2018. It's a history of the Roman Republic in its middle age uh, from 146 to 78 BC. That 68-year period, which ends 24 years before everything that Americans talk about when they talk about Rome, which is... and. Brits and people throughout time. So this is before Caesar. This is before the assassination, before the fall of the Republic. Mike Duncan, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Let's think about the Roman Empire today. Let's think about the Roman Empire today. Just you've been on the remnant before, um, but I want you, if you if you would indulge me, to just give a quick recitation of how. Is it true that you were once a fishmonger? Yeah, yeah, I did that for five years, in fact. So take us from fishmonger to two-time New York Times best-selling author and influencer uh, for the Toga community. <laughs> they they were they were concurrent. Um, I was out of college, spinning my wheels a little bit, just you know, having fun with my friends. Um, had got it, got a day job of working at a grocery store and and cutting fish and selling fish. And while I was doing that, you know, during breaks and off hours, um, I just went through a period where I was reading all of the ancient historians. Um, the first one I read was Livy's early history of Rome. Then I read Suetonius's 12 Caesars. And then I just like tripped into the thing and didn't come out for, uh, like five or six years. So I'm, I'm reading Polybius, I'm reading Plutarch, I'm reading Thucydides. Um, and, uh, I, I'm also discovering this is back in like 2006, 2007. 
um, that people are starting to put these things called podcasts online. Um, y- y- some of the major universities like MIT and Stanford were starting to like publish lectures online. And I was like, this is okay. This is great. This is a wonderful use of, of the internet. I can load this onto my iPod, right? Because this is all like still pre iPhone. Um, you know, we're, we're not even at iPhones yet. I don't think. And, uh, I mean, that's where, that's where the name comes from. That's why they're podcasts. And so I'm, I'm putting, you know, so I've got Roman history is just rattling around in my head and I kind of went looking for a Roman history podcast to supplement what I was, you know, teaching myself and no such thing existed. So I was like, this is, this will be great. Maybe I can, I'll start a podcast and I'll just start working my way through, um, the stories that I'm finding in these ancient histories that nobody ever reads, nobody ever engages What I mean in the general public, not like academics, but the general public doesn't really engage with a lot of like the earlier history of Rome because it's buried in very dry, very boring texts that most people, you know, you get about six sentences into Livy and your eyes are glazing over and you're falling asleep. But for me, I, there's something that I really enjoy about it. And I, I felt quite captivated by, um, by all of those texts instead of like bored and put off by them. So, you know, especially the early history of Rome podcast is a lot of just me taking Livy and Plutarch and putting it into language that was understandable to a modern audience and just started putting it out there in the world while I worked my day job uh, cutting and selling fish, which was a great, it was, it was a very nice balance because the, the job was all physical it did not require, uh, you know, it does not require a great deal of like intellectual, um, you know, rigor to cut fish for people. And so I could just do that during the day. I could think about, you know, whatever I felt like thinking about. And then when I got home at night or on the weekends, you know, I wasn't carrying this job with me home. Um, you know, they, they tried to turn me into an assistant manager and I'm like, I don't want to worry about how much cocktail sauce we sell. I want to talk about what's happening in the second Punic war. That's where I want my brain power to be. Um, and yeah, I did that for, for most of the history of Rome, uh, until the end, that's what I was doing as my day job. So when you, uh, and have you learned a decent bit of Latin along the way, or were you always reading in translation? No, I, I mean, I'm reading in translations. My Latin has, you know, went from non-existent to barely passable, uh, I do know some things about Latin now. Uh, you know, I, I did teach myself some rules and then I, I had to learn, I had to learn French to do the Marquis de Lafayette book. And so sort of while I was, while I was learning French because I lived in France for three years and while I was sort of intensively studying French, you know, so much of that has Latin roots in the language that like I've, I sort of went backwards into it. It's like, Oh, I can, I can sort of root, learn the roots of a lot of these words that I need to learn so that I can like get baguettes when I'm in Paris. Um, and that'll also inform, you know, my ability to do Roman history. The high, the highest cause, of course, is the uh, the obtaining of delicious uh, French bread and pastry. Right. You know, have the coin, have the coins in hand, the exact change. Those people do not like to make change. You got to have exact change with them. They are not. They are not here for your convenience. Uh, that that no. this this is uh, definitely true. Okay, so. How reliable, and so I I came to your book, The Storm Before the Storm, obviously late, five years late, um, but really loved it and really found it engrossing. And I think what's good about the way that you do history, so um, when I write history, I'm writing as a journalist, right? Because that's what I am. Uh, and I write, I'm, I'm trying to give readers uh, or listeners the uh, most accessible, most understand it, uh, understandable uh, version of events. Um, but I have never uh, gone back into ancient times. How reliable is, uh, is what we know really about what was going on 2000 years ago and older? It's very difficult to truly say, you know, what about this is 100% true and what about this is not. There, there are many things that like, you know, we know that Caesar was a thing. Right. Right. For example, uh, we have we have literary texts about him. We have his own writings in hand. Uh, There are inscriptions and there's archaeological evidence. Right. You can you can we can cross reference from like a bunch of different ways that we do know that certain things happened at certain times in certain ways. Um, The literary sources that we rely on, um, you know, Plutarch and Livy, uh, especially um, Polybius, I think is a bit more, he, he at least tries to be a bit more rigorous is that the Romans and Greeks had a very different conception of history than we do. 
which is, you know, our conception of history, which is sort of a modern invention, is that we're trying to go back and recreate an incredibly factual accounting of the past. We want to know what happened, who did it, where it happened and why. Um, and having having sort of very, very rigorous standards of evidence and facts. Whereas the Romans were usually deploying history in the service of teaching like a moral lesson or, uh, you know, some story about civic virtue or the way that you're supposed to behave in the world. So like Plutarch's biographies, Plutarch is a Greek writer, but Plutarch's biographies, which we use for Marius and Sulla, he's got one for Romulus, he's got one for Caesar and Cato. Like we always know that these texts are going to air not on the side of objective truth, but on the side of does this prove the point that I'm trying to prove? Um, or am, is this building up a sort of a moral lesson that I'm trying to build up? So we always have to take these things with a grain of salt. Um, and then when you get into like the Julio Claudians, like we, we all know them from, you know, from I Claudius, you know, the mini series or just, you know, Collect like Caligula is in the, the word Caligula yeah. and Nero are in the collective unconscious. <laughs> yeah. And we we know about these guys um, from people like Tacitus and Tacitus is a great historian. He's arguably the best of all of them. Um, but he was he was from a senatorial aristocracy that had been pushed aside and he had he had bones to pick with these people. And if you read through Tacitus, you know, he's dropping very scandalous accusations um, about these emperors that have now been com you know completely taken at face value and i'm sure some of it is true but a lot of the rest of it is really like you know it's these are partisan documents sometimes and so you're getting like the most partisan take on some of these people um and so it's like you know, how much of this is true like most of it probably uh but definitely some of it is is definitely made up and um uh, in service of, of different objectives than our objective, which is to just find out what happened. I, I point people to the plays of Shakespeare, which were historical plays, uh, but were uh, had political current political uh, o over and undertones. And of course, we're often in service of a sovereign who he very much wanted to satisfy. So his so these are shared historical facts that people held in common, uh, or there was a, a basic knowledge of that could be used to instruct or used as a basis to tell a story. Okay, Roman Empire, one forty six BC. What uh, set the scene? How's how's life in Rome, uh, one forty six BC? Well, the Roman Empire itself in, in this period is is having its triumphant moment. Um, you know, we, we know that Rome starts as just this little city state back in the you know seven hundreds, eight hundreds. You know, the, all of this is just completely lost to time. Like even Livy is like, we have no idea what happened back then. Um, so here are some fun stories for me to tell you. And uh, the, the Romans just sort of expand, but they're just another city state in the Mediterranean. And then they go through this crucible of the Punic Wars. This is when Hannibal shows up. And by the time you get to 150 BC, the Romans are defeating the Carthaginians in what's called the third Punic War. They have also in that same year, uh, they are, they, they raise corn, uh, excuse me, Corinth to the ground in Greece, which really puts them in permanent hegemony over Greece, which, you know, was the greatest of the classical civilizations and the Romans knew it. And then from there, they're going to pivot right over into the East and kind of sweep up through Syria. They've got Egypt in hand at this point. Um, and they really are the dominant power in the Mediterranean world. And that is going to hold true for hundreds of years. And I think you could even say with the continuation of the Eastern Roman Empire, you know, through the fall of Constantinople, you're talking about, you know, Ro the Roman order, the, the Greco-Roman order um, is going to hold sway over the Mediterranean for like a thousand years. So that's where the empire is. Uh, the people of the empire, however, there is this, there's an increasing divergence between the very wealthiest of the Romans and the poorest of the Romans, where they, they did have somewhat of an egalitarian society that reminds me a little bit of like uh, sort of like the colonial period in America where George Washington, for example, he's the richest American. But if you would put him back in England, he's like minor gentry. Um, you know, he's he's actually not that wealthy. And then the poorest, you know, colonial Americans um, are doing much better than the poorest people back in Britain or back in France, for example. Um, and what was happening in the Roman Empire was uh, the spoils of all of these great conquests that had been going on uh, started accumulating in the hands of the senatorial aristocracy. 
and the small holding farmer, sort of the backbone of the old citizen legions, started getting dispossessed of their land. They started uh, find they they started falling into debt that they couldn't get out of. They had well, don't, to sell well, out. Don't t- don't take us too far. Don't take us too far down the path because that's that's kind of the payoff. The yeah. but this is this is the moment that um, our founding fathers and Americans and Britons uh, to this day would have said. This is this is what you want to preserve, right? It's a republic. Uh, it's mm-hmm. strong. It is a um, it, it's a it's a hegemon, uh, and it's it's safe. It's defeated its enemies uh, substantially, and has a, a form of self government, right? And, and we'll talk more about the limits of that, but has a form of self government and is ruled by the Senate. And this is this is what you're supposed to want. But as your book very, uh, very effectively points out, the tensions underneath that, one of the tensions underneath that that I found really interesting and a great parallel to today was the question of who is a Roman and what is who what is it to be a citizen of Rome and how the uh, populism of the day. And I want to talk a lot about the Grokkans, but the, how the populism of the day was in substantial part driven by the question of who's going to be able to vote and who's a citizen. So talk up, talk, if you will, about citizenship in Rome at this point. Sure. Um, so Rome, the Romans are the people from the city of Rome, right? And and sort of surrounding Latium. We're, we're talking about a very circumscribed area is who is technically a Roman. And when the Romans were began their expansion into Latium, uh, the you know sort of the, we're talking about cities that are like 10, 15 miles away from them. You know, this is all very close quarters. Um, the, they get ab- those people will get absorbed into the Roman system, and then the Romans continue to expand from there. They there was a very strong distinction between the Italians, right, the Italian people, and the Romans inside of uh, you know inside the system. And when, when we think about sort of we move forward to like the the high empire hundreds of years down the line, you know the idea that like the Italians a, as a rule weren't Romans would be a very sort of like it's a hard thing to fit your head around. But there was a clear distinction between Italians and Romans, and the Romans brought the Italians into their system. They were conquered. They, the Italians start serving in the legions. The Italians um, are th- – their political units, their own city-states are operating under Roman hegemony. And these Italian peoples are becoming fully integrated members of Roman society, like the Roman way of doing things. Um, you know, the, when the legions are going out and doing these conquests, the Italians are the ones who are providing the bulk of the manpower because there's obviously many more Italians than there are just Romans from the city of Rome. And what was frustrating to these Italians is that they would say, I'm just, you know, just to work in broad figures, they were, they were providing two thirds of the soldiers for the legions, but then only receiving one third of the spoils, you know, when those were doled out at the end of the war or at the end of the battle. So the Italians after- and, and Rome, Rome at this point is acting kind of like a, uh, not kind of like uh, a colonial power. The people who live in Rome are, en- are enjoying the benefits of the work of the people outside of Rome. They're not having to do the kind Kind of work uh, that they would have to do to sustain a city of that size, uh, and they're the only ones who get to vote. Yes, and they so they and they have citizenship, and so they're controlling who the consuls are, who the praetors are, uh, who the other magistrates are, and those magistrates then being elected by the people of Rome, um, you know, are always going to be working with Rome's principal interests in, at heart instead of sort of like the interests of all the people who are now in the Roman system, which uh, which is going to include the Italian peninsula as a whole. And then later as Rome expands, is going to, you know, Gaul and Spain and, you know, Syria and North Africa. So citizenship, the question of citizenship and the question of who gets to vote is something that's a it's a central sort of battle inside the storm before the storm, which is, you know, the first book. Which ends with, I I would say that there's a great civil war between Marius and Sulla, where some of the battle lines are drawn over Marius being pro 
citizenship for the Italians. Bring the Italians in as full citizens. Let them be full voting members. Have Let's have no more distinction between Roman and Italian. And Marius very famously is like, you know, in the dust and din of battle, you can't tell an ally from a Roman, right? They're all in, we're all in this together. And Sulla, who was his more aristocratic rival, um, had been backing resistance to this, that, that, that the old Roman aristocracy wanted to keep things for themselves. They, they wanted to keep the Italians as second-class citizens because they did think that Romans were superior. Um, and I think that the big turning point of that final civil war that wraps up the book is Sulla coming back from the east. The Italians are prepared to fight him to the death because they want citizenship. And if Sulla wins, they're not going to get citizenship. But Sulla just goes around and says, you know what? Let's just do citizenship. I don't care. It's great. Um, you know, yeah, now that I thought about it, now that now that I've thought about it, you guys are right. And I want to be in charge. And we're just going we're, we're going to absorb that. energy. I'm, I'm going to steal, as we would say in modern political terminology, I'm going to steal your issue. Right. I'm going to I'm going to take that for myself. And instead of fighting you, I'm going to take it for myself. Yeah. Mar- Marius had staked his defense of Italy to the fact that the Italians were going to back him to the hilt because he was the only one supporting full citizenship for the Italians. And then, yes, yeah, Sulla stole the issue. The Italians are like, well, if if both sides are going to give us what we want, then there's no reason for us to fight and die for anything. The Marian resistance collapses and Sulla wins. And then, the, and then the Italians get citizenship. And ever after, you look back and you're like, it's weird that the Romans spent so much time trying to resist this thing, which then only sort of like made their polity stronger um, and made the entire system far more integrated and robust going forward. But the uh, sharing what you have in politics, sharing what you have with other people very often sounds like a bad idea, especially if you are content with the status quo. I want to go back first, though, to, you know, what a lot of people thought about on uh, January 6th, which was, and I don't know whether this is the first time violence was introduced into Roman politics, probably not the first time violence was introduced, but of large scale violence. Uh, early in your book, we, we hear about basically an election that takes place. Uh, it is disputed and uh, it ends with uh, a lot of dead bodies in the river. Uh, talk, talk about, talk about that if you would a little bit. Yeah. I, I mean, you're kind of more right than you think. Uh, about the Romans not having a great deal of political violence before, you know, the Gracchan period. There was like very early days Republic, like 400s, like early 300s BC. There's a guy who tried to make himself king. They had to throw him off the Tarpeian Rock. That was a thing that had to be done. Um, but really, they, they chugged along for hundreds of years, electing two new consuls, a bunch of new praetors every single year. Uh, And they managed to get through this without really resorting to table legs and daggers and swords and and full-blown civil war and civil conflict. And that goes on until until the the, the opening of the book when the Gracchi come along. And Tiberius Gracchus, who's the one we're talking about right now, was simply – he was he was he was on his way up the uh, the political ladder, and there was a very set course that you had to follow if you wanted to ultimately be consul. And so Tiberius Gracchus is just trying to make his his name for himself, do like his first great thing that will make him popular enough so that when he wants to run for consul um, years down the road, he'll be set up for it. And he was looking at this problem of the dispossession of the poor Romans and the poor Italians inside of Italy after all these wars and how all these spoils are accumulating in the hands of the aristocracy of whom the Gracchi themselves were inner circle members of, right? They're, they're not like, but they're not like labor leaders from the streets. These guys are, are inner circle aristocracy. Uh, and so Tiberius Gracchus was trying to uh, get enacted a, a land redistribution bill called the Lex Agraria that would have taken some state owned land and, and redistributed it to individuals. Uh, and he was using his powers as tribune, tribune of the plebs, which were quite, quite strong, right? Like you were not allowed to touch a tribune. It was sacrilege against the gods to do this. These were the people who were supposed to protect the interests of the people, of the right? People. The Correct. job of the tribune yep. was so, so just, just to check my uh, recollections here. So you have a more democratic entity in the assembly yeah. that ha- that where people where citizens can come and vote you have the senate which is as you say aristocratic tightly prescribed about how you can rise into the senate 
But set aside uh, are these tribunes who are supposed to be a check on the power of the Senate, and they're supposed to look after the interests of the people. Is that about right? Exactly. And the tribune, it comes from a compromise several hundreds of years earlier because there was this running, you know, thing called the conflict of the orders between the patricians and the plebs that the patricians had, you know, many hundreds of years earlier. And I think this is sort of what gets the Republic, you know, onto its permanent firm footing. You know, Polybius believed this, for example, um, is that with the tribunes there and the, and the popular assembly there, that did act as a, as a permanent check on just the Senate doing whatever they felt like doing. So Tiberius is going to use this power to do what he thinks is in the interests of the plebs, which is to redistribute land to them. You know, the old Roman aristocracy does not like this very much. Um, you know, they had very strong property rights. They were like, this is mine. This is ours. We shouldn't just be giving it away to somebody because they happen to be poorer than me. And it led to sort of a, a game of chicken between Tiberius and his enemies where the, the Senate suborned one of the tribunes to veto the Lex Agraria, which any tribune could veto any piece of legislation anytime they wanted for any reason. And they suborned one of the tribunes to oppose the Lex Agraria. Uh, Tiberius Gracchus argued that therefore that person was now working against the interests of the people and was no longer to be considered a tribune. Uh, and they physically removed that guy from uh, from the assembly so he could no longer veto the bill. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the very beginning of like, let's physically use our hands and and force to like remove a political problem, which topped out at dragging the guy out of the assembly. They, pr they probably punched and kicked him a few times. I think that's probably true. Um, but the next step in this is they are, they, they've passed the Lex Agraria in, in Roman society, not by, um, not by a, a prescribed law, right? This was, they didn't really have a written constitution, but you're only supposed to serve one year if it's like whatever office it is. Like a consul is meant to serve for one year. A praetor is meant to serve for one year. A tribune is meant to serve for one year. And Tiberius decided that because his lexicary was so controversial and he couldn't be confident that the next group of tribunes wouldn't immediately cancel it, that he's going to run for re-election. There's like there's no concept of re-election in the, sort of the Roman political imagination. And so Tiberius is challenging something that even though it wasn't a prescribed rule, was like a very strong tradition. And, ta and uh, I just uh, just I want to pull you off on a little siding here. Yeah. Talk about the power of talk about the power of tradition uh, and the unwritten uh, constitution of the Republic. Uh, in for Americans, we have the experience of Franklin Roosevelt in 1940, uh, says, I'm going to run for a third term, e which was considered totally, uh, it was out of bounds because Washington had just set the standard mm -hmm. of two terms. You serve for two terms and then you can, exactly. and then you go back to Mount Vernon. Uh, and in 1940, Franklin Roosevelt says, you know, there's a war looming or there's a, a war underway in Europe. Uh, the, the new deal, uh, has not achieved the goals that I wanted it to achieve. It's too important. And I have to run for reelection. Uh, is that a, a kind of a modern comparison to the, the power of norms, uh, and, uh, in the, in the Roman Republic? Yeah, I would say so. Um, that's a good, that's a good parallel. And the, the Romans were very conservative people. And there was, there was a, there's a concept called most maorum, which is sort of the, the, the wisdom of the elders. And they wanted the, the Romans, you know, we today have this concept of like progress and advancement that we're always supposed to be kind of like improving things and making things better. We can make tomorrow better than today and today is better than yesterday. And this is kind of what we want to be doing. This is a very modern concept that really doesn't get going until like the Enlightenment. Whereas the Romans, they wanted today to be like yesterday and they wanted tomorrow to be like today. They just wanted the thing to kind of like just keep keep going, keep going um, without improving or, or getting worse or anything. So Tiberius doing this, you know, he, he could, he could say, well, there's no, you know, it's, it's a bit like there's no rule that says a dog can't play basketball. You know, if, if you're doing like an, you know, like air bud in air, air bud, yes. you know, so Tiberius is basically doing an air bud where there's no rule against a dog becoming tribune again. And he goes for it because he believes that what he's doing is so important. And I, you know, I, I don't think that he was necessarily wrong about this. I think that the Lex Agraria might have been under direct threat had he not run again. But this is considered a real, real shot off the bow and very close one 
uh, to the sort of more conservative elements of the aristocracy uh, who thought that this would be the thin end of the wedge, um, that there was a populist wave coming and that they would start to ignore all the old rules that had kept everyone in check and everyone meaning the aristocracy uh, in check. And so they went up there and they broke it up. Uh, the Pontifex Maximus, who was the you know the the head of the the final official Roman religions, is the one who is leading the charge here. Uh, they go up there with table legs, uh, various sticks, uh, other sort of bludgeons, because you weren't allowed to carry weapons, and they they had traditions about uh, and religious uh, restrictions on carrying actual weapons. And they went up there and they broke up this reelection. They there were scuffles, and then there was a full blown fight, and people started getting beaten to death. And Tiberius himself was identified and beaten to death with a table leg. And then all of uh, the dead bodies were thrown into the Tiber River. And this is how they prevented the reelection of Tiberius Gracchus. And so one, one thing that I do like to uh, sort of slip in all the time when I talk about this is we talk about the Gracchan era as uh, so the, the Gracchi introduced violence. Like they are going to use violence to achieve their ends. And really the first people who did like a full blown, we're going to use like violent murderous force to achieve our ends was actually the conservative aristocrats who were trying to stop all this. And so the Gracchan era becomes when violence is introduced into the system. Uh, but I really do think that most of the first bloody uh, thrusts were made by the conservatives rather than these rising populists. I, I had I thought of the uh, analogy of splitting an atom when I was when I was reading your book about the force that was unleashed, and in terms of blame, uh, it doesn't matter that much uh, because I don't know any of these people, uh, and none of them are running for re-election. But the force that begins with, so you have the first Gracchi says, you know what? Enough. We're got, this is what we have to do to, to obtain the outcome that we need to do. And if it doesn't follow tradition and it doesn't follow our unwritten constitution, it's something that we have to do because it's that important. And that that sort of unleashed that power from inside that atom that first uh, presents itself in. And these were senators, right, beating people to death with table legs, right? These were these were the elites themselves. So if we can if we can picture John Thune uh, going down on the steps of uh, the of the of the Capitol bludgeon, bludgeoning someone to death with a table leg, uh, you have this radical, violent departure. Uh, and that sets off this period uh, that you write about where uh, there is it, it, the widening gyre of we've started to violate the rules. So I killed you because you violated the, we killed you because you were violating the rules. Well, now that you've killed somebody over violating the rules, what else is possible? What else can we do? If, if that's the standard, if you can say, because we are protecting what we think is important, we can kill our enemies. And boy, does it get going? I mean, like, like, wow. Yeah, I mean, ch chapter chapter one is a loose ad hoc mob that is led up to do this. Like, this was not like th this was not super well planned in advance. They were just like, we have to go up and put a stop to this, and then things happen. Um, by chapter three, you have Gaius Gracchus, who is Tiberius's younger brother and his heir. Um, Tiberius, Gra or excuse me, Gaius Gracchus has an even bigger, you know, package of reform. He has seen his own brother killed uh, for trying to enact reforms that Gaius Gracchus himself believe in. So Gaius, you know, he's got swordsmen on retainer. Um, he is he does build out kind of a like a gang. It would be you know a fair enough way to put it. As his senatorial adversaries are also building their own gangs. So now you've got sort of like street toughs, swordsmen, you know, uh, veteran soldiers uh, looking for work who are now on retainer from some of these major political figures. Uh, and you get scuffles in Rome, you get various, um, you know, get various confrontations, people fight. And then of course, you know, this, like it becomes a bit of a Hatfield and McCoy situation where, you know, you killed Tiberius. So now we have to do something to you because, you know, we're fighting for him. And then, uh, oh, and then you kill Gaius, so now we got to come back. And then, oh, well, you you did something to us. And it becomes this like tit for tat thing where, everybody feels like they have a grievance that is um, justifiably being pursued. 
Uh, and by the time you get to the end of the book, we're no longer dealing with like little ad hoc improvised mobs or even, uh, you know, little street toughs on retainer, but full blown armies and, and a Roman civil war between Marius and Sulla. And then that just paves the way for people like Caesar and Pompey and Octavian, uh, where we do live in a world now that politics is settled by brute force. And that's how it goes. It is, it is no longer the, you know, it's no longer about consensus building necessarily. It's no longer about winning an election and then having your adversary be like, okay, well you won and I lost. And so I guess I'll just go home now. It's you won and I lost. And so I'm going to go back to my army and then we will figure out like who actually won. And part, and part of this, um, you know, would I, I hate to keep coming back to January 6th and you wrote this book before January 6th. I did. <laughs> but the 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 people who were attacking the Capitol, who were smashing in the windows, clubbing police officers with flags, defecating in Nancy Pelosi's wastebasket, they thought they were doing the right thing. Right? Yes, they absolutely. believed that they were. Stand, they thought they were standing up for the Constitution. They thought that they were stopping a grave injustice. Uh, and uh, the fact that the response from the other side, we, I, I feel very grateful that the response from the other side was not violence in return, right? That the, the, the response was not, oh, okay, well, you, you come and sack the Capitol. Now, of course, we've got a 2024 election coming up uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll see how we, we fare under that. Uh, before we leave this period, talk a little bit about voting and how voting worked uh, at this time. What, what, when we say uh, the, Democra the demos, the democratic element in the Roman Republic, uh, talk about that. Okay, I promise I will not get into the weeds of Roman voting procedures, which is something I'm fully capable of doing and will get lost in them. So <laughs> I will like, so basic things. This is a physical vote that is taking place, right? It's a real in person live vote. So people, there's an election day, people do have to come down at a certain time to the forum uh, there, you know, by this point, they will have set up like a platform where the votes are going to be taking place. There's like corridors that people walk down, like it's a very well organized system. And they voted by tribes, which works a bit like the way that the Electoral College works, where like one tribe would get one vote. So it was really it was having a vote for who got the most votes within a tribe. And then that tribe would cast one collective vote. And there was, um, you know, I think there was probably 20 tribes by the end of this or maybe a few fewer. I forget. How did you figure out who was in a tribe? What was it? Was a tribe just a family? Was it geographical? Your tribal placement was as central to your identity as a Roman citizen as anything else. Um, you were, you came up from birth inside of a tribe. That's what you were assigned to. And that's where you voted. It would be a bit like, you know, whatever state you were born in just okay. was what you voted through for the rest of your life. So I'm from Washington and I would just always be voting in the Washington tribe. Um, the, uh, uh, the check on this or, you know, something that does have to be kept in mind is that in order to vote, you have to be physically present in Rome, like you have to get there. Um, so to the extent that there are popular like like lower class voters, which, you know, if you were a poor Roman and you were a citizen, you absolutely got to vote. We were not in a situation where you had to have a certain amount of property. We were not in a situation where uh, you have to pay a certain amount of taxes. Like if you're a citizen, you can vote. But if you're a poor citizen and you're, you're outside of Rome and you can't get to Rome that day, then you're, you're never going to show up. You can't show up. Uh, so only really the people who can, who are in Rome are going to be doing this. And so it, it tilts the whole thing in a sort of in a conservative and, and aristocratic direction because they can manipulate it more. Um, but it really is just a bunch of people getting together one day and casting votes and having those votes announced. And in the book, you know, as, as, as I was watching January 6th and they're, they're going in there to essentially overturn you know, the voting urns, they, they had voting urns, right? There was, there was like a pot and you were dropping your votes in. This is, this is how all this stuff worked. And inside the storm before the storm, um, I think in chapter 10 or 11, there's a moment where there's a vote that's going to go against somebody and their people, their, um, you know, their street toughs on retainer rushed the stage, kicked over the voting urns, scattered the votes like, oh, well, you know, like, I guess this is, um, I guess we'll just declare a winner instead of uh, worrying what was in that thing that we just physically trashed. And now we don't know what the vote actually was like. That's how immediately parallel 
uh, some of the stuff that was happening in the later stages of the Roman Republic is happening today. And that's what January 6th was trying to do. They were trying to disrupt the legitimate transfer of power from one person to another. Um, and obviously, as you said, and I think that this is it, you know, you can't ever tell what is going on in the minds of anybody. Like, of course, the official position is we believe that this election has been stolen. And that is why we are here. We are saving the Constitution. We are saving the Republic. You know, Joe Biden and the Democrats. And there's a huge conspiracy to have stolen the election from Trump. Like none of this is true. And it's not entirely clear to me how much the people who are rushing into the Capitol believe that it was true or simply believe that they were just generally on the side of the angels politically. And so whatever they did was okay. Um, and if that meant asserting against all fact, all reason, all logic that Donald Trump actually won the election, then that's something that they're happy to do. Whether they believe it or not, I don't know. and I'm not sure it matters. Reason, reason is the servant of the passions. Uh, yeah, it has ever sure. been thus, and will ever yeah, more sure. be thus. It's it, uh, the uh, confirmation bias is a is a hell of a drug. Yes, uh, it is. Okay, take take us uh, forward. You you hinted at how we come to the end of this, but but take us through at a clip uh, about how we go from the introduction of violence and disruption into uh, stability. Into stability? Well, I mean, <laughs> well, Rome gets there eventually, right? Yeah. The, the next time that there is stability, you know, if, if you, if you open if you open up uh, the Pandora's box of, of violent civil conflict and you say that this comes along with Tiberius Gracchus, uh, you know, in like the one thirties BC, we are not at anything resembling civil peace until Octavian's final triumph in 27 BC, which comes after decades and decades of civil war, where the Republic itself and the, the grandees of the Republic, um, who had always been military leaders, were now military leaders, but using their armies not against Rome's foreign enemies or to protect the frontiers, um, but against each other to prosecute their domestic political objectives. Um, so Caesar's running armies, Crassus is running armies, Pompey's running armies, Octavian is the, the Brutus and Cassius, as soon as they kill Caesar, the very first thing they do is go out to their armies so that they can, you know, wage war against Octavian and Mark Antony Then Octavian and Mark Antony are fighting each other. So once, once the Pandora's box was opened, it did lead somewhat inexorably. I, I kept trying to find little off ramps that they could have taken along the way, but at any moment where an off ramp could have been taken, it just seemed too reasonable. Bo both sides had good reasons for not taking the off ramp um, and, and to instead kind of try to one up each other and one up each other again until it really is just, you know, the politics of the thing is practically, um, you know, a sideshow to just straight contests of will between major Republican figures. And it's not until Octavian wins. Uh, that the Pax Romana starts to set in, which is the beginning of the empire. And the early imperial period really is like one of the big thing that's happening is a restoration of peace, not the restoration of the Republic, but a restoration of peace. And like, by this point, everybody is like, yeah, sure. Like Republic, no Republic. Like who cares? Like, let's just have peace. Um, and it of course settled on the fact that Octavian murdered every single one of his enemies. <laughs> they had prescription lists. And so there wasn't anybody left to oppose what Octavian was doing. Um, and therefore there was peace. And uh, I guess when I look at this, I, th I think about as, as a, as a student of politics, I think, is this what happens when you have a power that becomes a hegemon becomes so great uh, and there is so much wealth and there is not an external threat. Yeah. So if you have a polity that is built around the idea of we have to vanquish our external foes because they pose a threat to our way of life. They will come and kill us. They will they will sack our city. They will do these things that when you become an apex power, it becomes harder to maintain domestic tranquility because those passions that had been directed outwardly are now directed inwardly. Am I making that too complicated? No. And that's something that the Romans themselves observed um, in the ancient texts. We will find themselves making reference to the fact that, you know, like Rome won the Punic Wars. We, we you know, won this, ex, this great existential um, 
uh, conflict against the Carthaginians. And as soon as that happened, the Roman leadership starts turning on each other and it starts becoming more important to win domestic political battles than really worry about the external cohesion of the empire because there's really nobody threatening our external cohesion. And, you know, that's long been one of the things that was pointed to. Um, the parallel to this being, you know, the United States coming out of the Cold War. Uh, you know, there there is, you know, the Washington consensus, which is a thing that, you know, is vague and hard to define, but we all know existed. Um, that comes from the Cold War period. There's no, there's no real need for a Washington consensus anymore after the Cold War. And we, I think that we, you can trace the uptick of um, this kind of brinksmanship politics at home to the early nineties and coming directly out of the Cold War. Oh, preach it, brother, preach it. Yeah, I do think, I do think that there is something to it, but at the same time, you know, uh, by the time that Marius and Marius and Sulla uh, get wrapped up in their final civil war because of an enormous threat posed by King Mithridates and Mithridates was coming out of the Black Sea and he had put together like a rather enormous Black Sea empire for himself that he was able to put hundreds of thousands of soldiers into the field and have them begin to take over Greece and, and you know bring it back from, from the Romans. And the big conflict between Marius and Sulla was who should get the prestige uh, of going off to fight Mithridates, which was, you know, Ultimately, Mithridates, I, I would not call him a paper tiger, but, you know, his soldiers were just not as well trained as the legions. You know, no soldiers in the ancient world were. That's kind of why the legions are so good. Um, and so when Sulla gets over there and faces Mithridates, he does make pretty quick work of him. But there was a moment when there was this huge external threat that, like, the Romans have to go face. They're about to lose Greece. And instead of doing that, Marius, Marius especially at this point, is the one who's who's being a bit of the bad actor here, um, which I will make a point. Let me Remind me to make a point about this. Um, but there, there was an external threat there. But I think that by that point, they had gone far enough down the road of civil conflict being an acceptable thing that – they just kept going with it. So it was in the context of a foreign war that a civil war breaks out. So that's something to keep in mind. That's never a good sign. Yeah. Well, one thing I will say, though, is that I do also look at an American parallel where we currently are living under a gerontocracy, right? Where we have elderly politicians who, you know, God bless modern medicine, are being kept alive and vigorous and healthy far longer than you know, human beings have ever been kept alive in the past. And it used to be that, you know, this sort of elderly generation would then retire, they'd become advisors, you know, they'd become mentors, rather than simply holding on to the reins of power forever and blocking uh, new blood from coming into the system. We've got a bunch of 80 year olds running everything when really it should be like 50 year olds, like, let's be clear about this. Um, and what the end of the book would storm before the storm, like the big thing was that Marius was older. And he had done his things. He had he had beaten back the threat that faced Rome in 100 BC. He was the hero. He was the third founder of Rome. He served five consulships in a row. And people were like, you know what? It was fine. He saved us. Now it's time for Marius to retire and for his protege, Sulla, to now have his chance to go off and be the great Roman who saved the Republic. But instead, Marius, who's now 20 years older, is like, well, I don't want to quit yet. I want to be the one again. I can't give up sort of being the only person who matters. So it's him really out of nowhere tr get, uh, trying to rescind Sulla's command of the war against Mithridates that sets off that final conflict, which is absolutely a story about an old politician who will not give up power to a younger generation. And if Marius had just been like, Yep, I'll advise you, but I've had my time and it's your time. Then we don't actually get that final Marian Sullen civil war, which I think really is when there's no hope for the Republic after that. Because the thing Sulla does to protect himself reasonably, you know, and I'm not even like a Sullen, but the things that Sulla was doing to protect his position were like not uh not beyond the pale. Because I think really what Marius was doing was the uh, was the one who he was the one who was breaking the system.
I had I had flashes of uh, modern politics when you were talking in your book about Marius going and working out in public very extravagantly. Yeah. Yeah. He's like doing push ups to prove that he's still got it. Yeah. And I was thinking of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. pumping iron uh, mm -hmm. as he's saying, like, I'm I may be old, but look at how vigorous look at how vigorous I am. And those uh, feats of public strength drew derision uh, in your telling for Marius yeah. that people were laughing at him about this, yes. this ridiculous old fool. Why doesn't he go away? And this is not in your book, but I, I think very often that Americans don't appreciate, um, you know, the, the power of going away. And, you know, we, we, we named the city of Cincinnati for George Washington uh, because Washington was emulating a Roman model in leaving. Uh, tell, tell us about, uh, it, I know you know it. Tell us, tell us the story of Cincinnatus. Well, C Cincinnatus is one of those sort of historical parables or, or, you know, that the Romans like to tell themselves to say, this is a historical person. And this is how you're meant to behave. And the, what Rome is is under threat from one of their neighbors um they are th there are some conflicts internally that are preventing them from from presenting a unified front they go to cincinnati and they say we want to have this we have this office of dictator which in the roman system was a was a regular part of the system which is you give one person all power for like a term of six months. You just let them no, no more consoles, no more vetoes, like no more, no more hitches in the system. Like let's just give one guy for six months, absolute power. He'll go off. He'll do the thing. Save us. And then at the end of this, Cincinnati is now holding absolute power, right? Which is something that all humans will be tempted to hold on to forever. Cause once you've got it, you can use it to hold on to it. And instead he's like, okay, my term is over. I will now set down my absolute power and I will return to the field uh, that I am plowing. I highly doubt that Cincinnati himself was plowing the field. He had slaves plowing his field, but it's a nice, um, it's a nice image and a nice story that then becomes what the Romans do. And this is that this is something that's very, very, you know, an, an interesting fact about the Roman Republicans was Caesar is the first one of them to get dictatorial powers and not give it up. And this is happening like in the 40s BC. They'd been running this republic. They'd doled out dictatorships. Um, I think there were like 25 or 30 different people over the course of the previous 500 years who had served a term as dictator because of some crisis that was facing Rome at the time. Like through the Punic Wars, it was just handing dictatorships one guy to the next. All of them set it down. All of them said, like, okay, my term as dictator is over. It's time to return to, um, you know, time to return to my family or return to my estates. So that that's to me a more notable thing than like why did why didn't Caesar give up power? It's like it's obvious why Caesar didn't give up power. He doesn't want to give up power. This is the most human thing on earth. Um, it's very interesting why no previous Roman had done that for like five hundred years. But that period, the the years between the the Gracchi uh, and uh, the end of your book mm -hmm. that broke the, that broke the consensus right uh that yep. was the that was the, the end of the most uh myorum that was the end yep. of those things and caesar and i think this is the very important takeaway for me from your book which is america is young uh, america uh in the in the story of empires of the world america is a kid uh, and R Rome had centuries of, as you say, basically effective governance, right? And the transfer of power and all of that, and all of that carried its way through over centuries. And once that starts to get disrupted, it's very hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube because yep. eventually the people, high caste, low caste, every caste, say, it's too much. It's just too much. I, I, I don't want to be right anymore. I just want this to be over. And if somebody is strong enough and powerful enough that they can bring us stability and that they can bring us, I'd rather, I'd rather be safe and I'd rather be prosperous than I would be free, uh, or, uh, have an, in, an intact Republic. Right. Yeah. And you know, the, 
by by the time you get to Caesar's generation, I mean, the the Senate was doing they were not really selling the merits of the Republican system by the end. Um, there were the Romans were, as I said earlier, the Romans were not an innovative people. They were not a reform minded people. So it is kind of hard to be like, well, why didn't you just like embrace reform and progress? Um, because it was kind of anathema to their way of thinking. But people like Caesar and Gaius Gracchus did recognize that things needed to be changed. And they could sell that to people and and not in a, like a disingenuous way. Um, it's not like Caesar was uh, just play. I mean, Caesar's placating the mob because Caesar wants to be all powerful. But the things that he was presenting to them, the things that he was going to do were vital and long overdue reforms that had been resisted by, you know, the optimates, the inner circle of the Roman aristocracy um, who were resisting all of this stuff. So that becomes part of it too. There's just this like mutual intransigence between these two political factions. And if you're, if you're a poor Roman, you're going to look at what Caesar is selling and be like, well, this is going to be better for me. And I, all he's saying is that like these old rich guys who I don't care about anyway are going to get taken down a peg. That seems fine to me. I don't care about that. And then once it all shakes out in Octavian's one, yeah, I think people mostly wanted peace more than they cared about Republican government. Um, and certainly like if you look out into the provinces, you know, we can expand this. We've been talking a lot about Romans and Italians. Uh, it's pretty clear to me that being a provincial Roman, right, somebody who was a subject of the empire out in the provinces, life was way better under the empire than it was under the Republic. Uh, the Republic was still send it had to send out a consul to be a proconsul, and they were swap they were swapping out their uh, their provincial governors once a year, and it cost a lot of money to have a political career in Rome. And so all of these guys took on enormous debts to climb up the ladder, and then they would spend their year or two in the provinces making all of their money back by extracting from the provinces. And once that system goes away, there's a regularity to taxation that begins to set in, and you don't have a new governor every year being like, oh, well, did you pay the last guy a whole bunch of money? Well, I need it too, because that was the only way that I won my election as Praetor, because I had to throw these games. I took on this debt. So anyway, now you guys owe me a bunch more than you expected. Um, and all of that sort of goes away. So the, the, like, the empire and autocracy, these are not like great things, but at the same time, the, if, you, if you're in Spain or you're in Gaul, you're like, yeah, get rid of these Republican governors. I do not like these people. I never did. It's almost as if if you had a republic that became sclerotic and could not function to meet the demands of the people, that eventually the people will prefer autocracy to republicanism. I, I'm just 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 throw, just throwing that out there. Just throwing that out. Yeah, it's a thing. And it's and the thing is, and then you look at it and you're like, it, it's, it's sad that they would make that choice. But it's also like, hmm. I mean, was it the wrong? Is it the wrong choice? I don't know that it is. The, you think we when we think about, you know. You do a good job in your work here and elsewhere talking about generations and uh, 68 years, uh, the period of time that you focus on in this book, you know, that's just two or three generations. Mm -hmm. And so much changed in the world and so much changed about the understanding of that. Uh, but for Americans, it's very hard to think about because three generations for us seems like a very long time when you're living in it and you're doing it. Three generations seems like an ex the, the time uh, to our grandparents uh, seems like a long time ago when they were uh, our age, seems like a great deal of time ago, but in historical terms, it's the blink of an eye. Okay. I'm going to turn you loose, but I want you to tell me if you can a, a, a more appealing story about ever, if you can think of, a place where the toothpaste starts to get out of the tube, whether it's in Rome, whether it's in a revolution anywhere, where the toothpaste starts to get out of the tube. Violence is in introduced. Uh, things become unstable, become dysfunctional. Uh, and that that harmony returns, that 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 people come back to themselves and you get you get back on a good foot. I can think of some instances, certainly in American political history, um, where things had become very unstable and we returned to ourselves uh, and not just the Civil War, but at, at various moments in American history about where things got unstable. But as you take the, the, a much broader and longer scope on history, you got any good news for us? Uh, yeah, I, I think that there probably is. I, I think, you know, some of the most obvious examples, like if you're coming out of the French Revolution, you know, did they ultimately, you know, sort of stop doing 
you know, incredibly violent factional political conflict. Yes. And it's because like Napoleon conquered them all um, in the same way that Octavian brings peace by co- winning and conquering everybody. And then they don't do civil conflict anymore because one person won. Um, but I do look to, you know, in an American political context, you look to the the later stages of the of the 1800s, like the late 19th century from like 1873. There was a, there was a huge recession that started in 1873. It used to be called the Great Depression. And now it's now we call it the long depression uh, that lasts into the 1890s that sev- was severely disrupted. This is the Gilded Age, right? That, so we we have these same kind of conflicts. We have it. We have the, the robber baron class, which is um, you know bearing g- gaining like all the wealth of industrialization, and then you have these working classes that are being worked to death. And we all know how bad their lives were. And there is there's rising unionism. Uh, there are conflicts between the working classes and and capital. And this is this is going. People are being assassinated. There are bombs going off. Uh, there are there are battles sure. that are happening at mine at mining camps between uh, police, sheriffs, uh, the proto FBI, and um, and the labor unions. Like there was there was real political violence. They bombed Blair Mountain in West Virginia for sure. The United States Army Air Corps for sure bombed Blair Mountain. Yeah, and this is one of the things. Like when when the Trump era gets going and people are like, oh, my God, are we going to have violence for the first time in American politics? It's like, <laughs> like mm, we've, we, we have actually done this before. And I think that one of the things that emerges from that is not a full blown either, you know, communist revolution uh, or the complete suppression of the working classes, which is kind of like the two diametrically opposed things that were happening there. And instead, you get this um, progressive initiative. There's a progressive wing of the Republican Party and there's a progressive wing of the Democratic Party that both emerges to say, well, look, you know, we're still we still want to do capitalism, right? We still want to do this kind of like free market style of of economics, but we have to admit to ourselves that we can't just have six year olds doing the work. We can't be producing food that has rats in it and razor blades in it. Uh, We can't have you know, a single trust that controls literally all aspects of our lives. There needs to be some rules of fair play here and there needs to be environmental legislation. There needs to be uh, worker health and safety legislation. And so you, a, a lot of what's coming out of the 1890s and then the early 1900s is a progressive reform minded response to all of this. And I think that that does take a lot of the pressure out of, of something that had been building to full blown civil war style conflict and emerges around the other side. And I would not be me if I did not here point out that that energy was then met with a tempering and balancing energy from Calvin Coolidge and uh, conservatives who wanted to adhere to the Constitution. And we found a new consensus. Right. Uh, We we uh, Americans returned to themselves uh, and found a way to improve the system, but maintain the system. Right. And then the system completely crashed and FDR comes along. Yeah. Well, yeah. But we do. And then and then FDR and then FDR, FDR, FDR is carrying, I think, forward. And I think one of the reasons why FDR was winning such smashing victories is that he was representing what was then a new consensus which is that which was a majority held consensus was that you can't just have unregulated free market capitalism it's clearly a disaster right to do this but you also like FD, fdr you know is a traitor to his class in the sense that he's working against the interests of like the old wasp aristocracy. But at the same time, like no communist is going to claim FDR as a leading light because they believe that he's heading off the revolution, that everything that he is doing is modifying and reforming capitalism in order to save it. And so he's, he's, I think FDR is operating inside of a new consensus that, that formed out of that progressive era in the 1890s and early 1900s. Um, to recognize that there is a way through this without having it become just brute physical conflict. And then a conquering general from a European campaign returns to the United States uh, and creates uh, a lasting consensus in the form of Dwight David Eisenhower. Right. Uh, see, there you go. There, there, there you go. There you go. Um, Mike, I'm incredibly grateful that you made time for uh, this. I, I, I think it's in, in, so important for Americans to understand that history did not begin five minutes ago. Uh, and the fact that you do so much to make history accessible to people where they are and how they are, 
uh, is a, a, a real gift. And uh, I'm grateful for your time and I'm grateful for your work. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Heck yeah. Okay. Uh, definitely read The Storm Before the Storm. But And I cannot recommend enough The Hero of Two Worlds about the Marquis de Lafayette. Uh, it's, it is a mwah, magnifique. Uh, Mike Duncan, thanks for being with us. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, please uh, send your angry emails about uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt to Jonah, not me, because I'm just guest hosting here. Uh, I'm not sure when Jonah will uh, return to us, uh, but we will carry him in our hearts until he does. Uh, so thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. No, you won't. This is my podcast. <laughs>